And welcome everybody to the patient engagement panel. Um, you've really been hearing a lot about patient engagement all day. Um, I think that's sort of um, indicative of the, the role that patient engagement plays. It, it's part of everything. It's um, multifactorial, I would even say multi-tentacled. Um, and we're here to explore that a little bit. We've got people from five different perspectives, five different areas of interest in patient engagement. Um, Henrietta, who's going to tell us about the government role of a, a government representative um, assigned to protect the patient interest. Um, Merapi, who will talk in her role as a, a family member and tell us about some of the solutions <laughs> that she's thinking of. Uh, Angie, with the um, professional point of view. Uh, Sue, on global um, engagement issues. And Vonda, last but not least, on um, the family and patient perspective on bedside practices and what we can do about that. So I'm not going to take too much time talking. I'm just going to turn it over to Henrietta to kick us off. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. And I found this morning and, and this afternoon so motivating um, hearing the experiences, but also the real passion of everyone here. And it's wonderful to have so many allies. So a patient safety commissioner role, why, why do we have this in England? And it's come about because patients were harmed and families were harmed and they weren't heard. And groups of patients taking sodium valproate during pregnancy and their children were harmed as a result. Women who'd had a pelvic mesh surgery for incontinence and organ prolapse. And also women who were given hormone pregnancy tests and their children harmed as a consequence. And these, these patients and their families found each other very much like we were hearing earlier through social media, <coughs> through being on television and in the press. And their voices together hadn't been listened to individually, but when uh, they, they raised their concerns through their politicians, through the members of parliament, a report was done, commissioned in fact by Jeremy Hunt, who will be speaking tomorrow. And Baroness Cumberledge, who wrote the review, also called First Do No Harm, so there was a great synergy there, made a recommendation that uh, there should be a patient safety commissioner to act as a golden thread in the siloed and disjointed, slow, um, and, and system which really lacked compassion. And that's my role, and I started in September last year. And I've been listening hard to the views and voices of patients and families uh, about their experiences, about the, uh, the wide range of different issues around medicines and medical devices. Uh, and I've had over 250 different correspondents contact me on a wide range of issues, much wider than the report. And my role is appointed by the government, although it's an independent role, and I'm accountable to the parliament. And my role is to value and promote the voices of patients and families, to ensure that patient safety is promoted, and to help the government and the system to listen. And that's no small task. We had over 127 million medication errors in England um, in, the, in a year. Um, but there are also a whole range of other issues to do with understanding who's had which treatment, what uh, medical devices patients have got, and there are a whole host of actions that are being taken as, as a result. But what I've found is that when we work together with the many different patient safety uh, departments and organizations, that we can actually start to speak with one voice, that we can put patient and family engagement in, at every stage in the design and delivery of healthcare, that I can work with the commissioners, with the regulators, and also with the providers of healthcare to understand how together we can do better. Because I think that if we don't, there's a risk that harm will persist, that the situations that we've heard about today will continue, that the statistics that we heard similarly um, in the USA as in other countries will look back and say, well, why didn't we act? And the people here in the room are the people to act. So um, I want to say again, thank you so much for having me and really keen to continue these conversations um, for the rest of the conference. Great. Thank you, Henry. Merapi. 
Um, yes, thank you. Thanks for having me and for um, listening to Martha's story. Uh, it's not the story I wanted for her, that's, that's for sure. Um, I will try not to repeat too much of what you heard this morning, but in case people didn't hear it, um, you know, my daughter Martha, she was healthy. She had a bike injury, um, the handlebars uh, went into her stomach. Um, she suffered pancreatic trauma. And at first, the NHS uh, worked how you would want it to work. She was helicoptered to a, um, a specialized hospital that dealt with pancreatic trauma. And uh, we were told many, many times she was going to be absolutely fine. It was just a question of time. Um, she'd be back at school soon. Uh, one doctor, I remember saying, um, uh, I'm going on holiday, because she looked like she was improving. You know, I, I hope not to see you when I come back. Um, but after four weeks of being in hospital, she got an infection. And at first, we weren't worried about that because she'd had an infection before and, um, you know, the antibiotics were given to her and it went away. And, uh, but with this one, that didn't, that didn't happen. And um, days passed and she didn't seem to be improving. She had an extremely high temperature. Um, and uh, then she started bleeding out of a pick line and a tube in her abdomen. Um, and I was quite worried about this. I think she was as well, my husband was. But um, uh, we were just told that her clotting abilities were slightly off and that it was a normal side of, infect of infection. And any doctor I've spoken to since then or has read Ma Martha's medical notes says that's absolutely not the case. A DIC is a really serious sign of um, sepsis. But uh, we were just told this was normal, a normal infection, and um, uh, we were never, the word sepsis was never used with us. But, um, Martha seemed to get worse, she was deteriorating. Uh, back holiday weekend was approaching, and at that point, my husband and I put, started to worry and put two and two together and actually talked about sepsis ourselves with the doctors who um, just re reassured us that that wasn't the case, uh, that this was normal, infections come and go with this injury, new, Consultant would come in again and say, this is normal. Um, by the Sunday of the bank holiday, she couldn't stand. She was um, dizzy. Um, and uh, she got a rash. And, uh, you know, a rash really set me on red alert because, you know, I'm not a doctor, but even I know that a rash with an infection is a, is a really worrying thing. Um, so I stood over her and said, I'm worried this is a sepsis rash. And the doctor insisted it was a, um, a delayed allergic reaction to antibiotic, which sounded to me odd and improbable, and I kind of questioned it, but I also thought, well, you're the doctor, you know, what do I know? Um, I talked to a nurse about it. I said, I'm worried he's got this wrong. Um, you know, I'm worried it's a sepsis rash. I've been looking it up because I started to look it up on the internet, and she just said, trust the doctors. They, they know what they're doing. So I decided to follow that advice, which turned out to be the worst advice I have ever received in my entire life. And... Um, Overnight, she just drank crazy amounts of water. The nurse came in, took her obs, which I know were bad, and uh, she collapsed at five in the morning. She was finally taken to ICU, uh, probably six days, I think, after she should have been, and we were quite quickly told uh, that she was at risk of death, and shortly after that, she died. Um, from our perspective, I think the most shocking thing for us is that the whole time we were by her side, we asked questions, we felt we were articulate, we were grateful, we were trusting, um, you know, so grateful. <laughs> we, we heard other people shouting at doctors and being rude, and we would never have done that. Um, you know, we felt that in some way that would give probably Martha the best care, um, and it didn't turn out that way. Um, in actual fact, we felt we were sort of managed and controlled by not using the word sepsis or um, not telling us how serious some of these things were because they might have thought that we would have looked up and known that she should have been in ICU and insisted that she get better care. So we were told almost nothing and just repeatedly told, this is normal, this is fine, um, until we were told that she was um, going to die. And... Um, just reflecting on some of the things that have been said this morning, uh, where people talk about protocols and um, practices and standards, um, 
the key thing I would like to say is that those things were in place at King's College Hospital in London where Martha was being treated. Um, there were at least six opportunities when she should have been transferred to ICU um, according to their own guidelines. Um, she was, you know, there was a BPUS chart, BPUS 5, she was meant to be transferred to ICU or a conversation was supposed to, she was at BPUS 8 on Sunday. Um, the nurses had put her at risk. That's, a, that's another sign that you should be transferred to ICU. And uh, the parents were worried. And in actual fact, uh, the parental concern, which is meant to be a trigger to, um, to move a child to ICU, the opposite happened. Um, the consultant who wasn't in because it was a holiday weekend, and I would like to say holidays, weekends, such an issue. Sometimes people try and say it isn't. It is a huge issue. It was a completely different atmosphere at the weekend. As I say, the consultant was at home. And he told the duty doctor not to get um, a critical care review for Martha uh, because it would only increase my anxiety. So that's the opposite of the hospital's own guidelines. So um, I think there's an issue when we talk about human factors is what happens when human over override, humans override the protocols and uh, guidelines that are in place, uh, which happened several times in Martha's case. Um, yeah. Yes, you're talking about humility and hubris. Um, Angie, go ahead. So, thank you, Helen. From the clinician's perspective, is I've been a registered nurse for 30 years, over 30 years. Um, 25 of those I've spent as a certified registered nurse anesthetist. And I know, like many of you, we've been talking about air and patient safety my whole career. And I even look back as when I graduated from anesthesia school, it was the same year that the Institute of Medicine released to air as human, which really did establish the what for us. We know there's a problem. But the part I want to emphasize is I'm not sure if we would have had that without the advocacy or activism. I'm, I'm going to start using that word now. Is the activism of patients and families who have been harmed um, contacting their elected officials and really saying you must do something about this. What came out of that clearly was the Institute of Medicine, the National Academies of Medicine, I think AHRQ, IHI. We have patient safety foundations. So we've got, we've got the what and we've got the people who are interested. Now the next step is really what do we do with it? Um, and I, Helen and I have had this conversation, is when I moved to South Carolina in 2010, one of the things that we had during my hospital orientation was talking about patient safety. And the thing that they mentioned was the Lewis Blackman Act from 2005. And they talked a lot about how providers need to identify themselves to patients and families. And patient and families' rights to, just like uh, Mary P. was saying, to a different level of care or a different provider. So I was indoctrinated in Lewis Blackman my whole career so far down in Charleston. And it wasn't until I was making sure I had my facts together for today that I was going back and looking at the Lewis Blackman Act and what it meant and how it came about and the years of it and realized that I was going to be sitting here <laughs> with Lewis's mom, yeah. which I think is amazing. So I contacted her and I said, can I talk about Lewis? <laughs> so when we teach our students, our nurse anesthesia students, about patient safety, one of the things we talk about really is that. So I, I want to make sure that advocacy and activism are so incredibly important. And I think that is something as healthcare providers that we can influence. Um, I was lucky that I worked in an ICU in Minnesota where the nurses were incredibly empowered. Uh, there, the hierarchy was very small. And what that did is not only was it a level, level playing field from the um, least credentialed person to the highest, but what it does, did is it created an ICU environment where nurses empowered patients and families. Uh, patients, we, I know visiting hours were mentioned. I was an ICU nurse back in the early 90s. We didn't have visiting hours. It was open hours, and families were there all the time. And this was in an ICU. And we made sure that all patients and families felt um, empowered and engaged. So the next thing I want to mention is a few things that I see are barriers from the what to the doing. Uh, one of them is, and we've heard it a lot, so I won't go on it too much, is implementation of evidence-based practice. 
I think nursing has come a long way in their doctoral programs very clearly. Uh, that is spelled out, is we practice evidence-based and the next thing that they do is gonna lead into my next barrier. I think that we often are working in healthcare systems and quite frankly in regulatory and legislative bodies where we don't have leaders who are prepared to step up and make that change and engage people who work there to implement evidence-based practice and to put patient safety at the top and to break down barriers and limit hierarchy. And then I'm gonna say the third thing I'm gonna say and that's, that's gonna lead into everything else is communication. When I take a look at all on the patient safety movement website and from listening to the ladies here who have lost loved ones, communication gaps and misunderstandings, I think are one of the number one things to lead to these egregious errors. So about effective communication is the first thing I'm gonna mention, it's about listening, not hearing. Listening involves an active intent not standing there hearing, but truly listening what that patient and family member are saying. I, I think that that is something we have got to really help our healthcare providers to do better at. Uh, I, I mentioned a little bit of my ICU about the experience that we were very engaged with families. And at that time, we were starting to talk about multidisciplinary rounds and how important it was for every healthcare provider to be on the same page. What I have seen is an incredible change in the last 10 years, not fully implemented. Uh, we do it where I work, is the family is involved in the rounding. So we have a multidisciplinary round where a family member is there and they are hearing what every consultant is saying at the same time and the plan is developed and families are empowered to ask questions. I think that is something that is important. The final thing uh, that I wanna mention with communication is living in the anesthesia world is most of my communication with patients and families is doing pre-op assessment and making sure that my conversation with them and the communication and the listening is non-biased and open and transparent so that patients can share those difficult conversations with me, whether it is their drug use or transgender or non-binary, all those things that are really difficult to talk about but they know that as an anesthesia provider, I'm there to take the best anesthesia care for them, and I need that information in order to do my very best for patients. And then I wanna talk a little bit to the AANA, the Association of Operating Room Nurses, and the American Society of Perioperative Nurses recently put out a statement on workplace civility. One of the reasons, and, and I see this in the operating room, I've worked a lot of places, so it isn't just one place, is we see the hierarchy sometimes and the incivility in the operating room has led to errors in the operating room. Things that never should happen, wrong site surgery. That if somebody was empowered to stand up and say uh, to the surgeon or to the anesthesiologist or the CRNA or to the nurse, this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, we've, got, we've got to work on that, and that is something as healthcare providers, anybody with an interest in patient safety, that's important. What incivility also leads to is problems with provider mental health, and that impacts patient safety also. Uh, two, two things that I think we need to work on a lot, uh, and we're working on it with the ANA, is dealing with uh, patient safety in our rural areas, especially obstetric, underrepresented minorities. That's got to be a priority for us in... in uh, patient safety, and our rural communities that don't have access at all to patient care, much less patient care that is not safe. And finally, and I'll put on my anesthesia hat again, and for anybody who's a patient in the room or a family, this, I wanna empower you for this, is in anesthesia, we are under incredible production pressures. Spend less, less time with patients, get the patient in the operating room, get the surgery started, that what has happened is we've lost that ability of that listening and listening and making sure that patients are truly heard. So for everybody out there who's a patient, is if, if we are moving too fast for you, tell us to stop. That's your right as a patient. It's important for us to know exactly what you need and what we can do for you. You are empowered to tell us that. And finally, the, the last thing that I wanna say is, and it, you made me think about it when you were talking about Kernicterus and you said he was the only person who'd had it. I'm sitting here going, I saw it myself, is 
um, some of the, the near misses that once we start talking about things, that we really do realize how many of us could have been in your boat is, um, and I get, I get a little emotional when I think about it too, is I had a near miss with a three month old. Um, I was told my daughter was dehydrated. I knew it, I was a nurse. I was told to put her to bed by the on-call pediatrician. I refused to listen to that. Took her to an ER, we ended up being gone by ambulance to a pediatric hospital and she spent, spent a night in the ICU. If I would not have stood up, the ending would have been different. And what I would say is I am so grateful that I was a healthcare provider and I think about those of you that are not and I knew the right things to say and do because I'd been there and not everybody has those abilities. So it's important that we educate patients and families of that also. So thanks, Helen. Thank you, Angie. And Sue. Thank you, Helen. Um, gosh, so much to say about this topic of patient family engagement. I mean, I think all, you know, Helen, <coughs> Fonda, Merope, and I, I think there were um, a common thread amongst all of us that we were, our, our, our um, cries for help were ignored and, and we were not listened to. And, um, you know, I've thought a lot about this. I've had 28 years to think about this, and um, there's just so much we can do about having healthcare workers to listen to us. We can't write a federal policy that you have to listen to your patient. And so that, that kind of took me and others who have experienced harm, like Helen and others, to the next level up where we got involved in policy. You know, we know that there's going to be this this vulnerable moment with patients where they're not listened to. So we have to ramp it up and get more into policy to prevent the harm, you know, getting in triggers and getting in forcing functions and, and other policies. And that's what we did for Kernicarus is we, re, we changed the standard of care so all babies are tested because the moms were, you know, not listened to. And so we, we ramped it up. And so policy is really important for us all to be involved in. And so that leads me to wanting to talk about, you know, what's going on globally with patient family engagement. And Sir Liam um, Donaldson, I think, and earlier this morning, the um, WHO's Global Patient Safety Action Plan has been touched on. I believe um, Neil M. Dingra is going to go through that action plan. And it's a um, remarkable plan that many of us patients read and feel like finally there is this comprehensive, multi-dimensional, all stakeholder plan for us to engage as partners to drive change. And Neelam will talk about this, but there are seven different strategic objectives in the WHO's plan. And um, one of those strategic objectives is patient family engagement. Now, this is not your traditional, you know, have your patients ask questions, although that's part of it. What they've really done is they've elevated patient family engagement into the government level, into the healthcare system level, into capacity building. And so they have five strategies that I think we can all learn from and all implement. Um, the first strategy is engage patients, families, and civil society in um, co-development of policies, programs, strategies, and guidelines. Without our input into these policies, we will not have a patient-centered, safe, equitable healthcare system. We need to be at the table. Um, the second strategy is learn from the experiences of patients and families exposed to unsafe care. I think we have an epidemic of not learning from us. And imagine what our healthcare system would look like if we had multiple mechanisms in place that we could report to, that there's surveys that are asking us questions about safety. I know we have our HCAPs, but what if HCAPs had questions about our experience in, in safety? So we're calling for these kinds of changes. Um, number three is to build the capacity of patients, families, and leaders in patient groups, and this has been talked about for years, but we simply haven't done it. You know, what if we invested in developing leadership 
with patients and families and patient groups, that we are at all the tables, that we are part of the healthcare sector. There were not, you know, there's some papers that refer to us as like the lost continent and, um, you know, the subcontinent that were kind of this lost world that were never, that were rarely invited to the decision making table. And so building the capacity of us and others and civil society, I think, is just, I really admire WHO for highlighting that. The fourth strategy is to establish the principle and practice of openness and transparency. I mean, you've heard this all day today. We've talked about it for 30 years. We haven't accomplished an open, honest healthcare system here or probably around the world. And I say we have to absolutely commit to that. And what I mentioned earlier this morning, that we have all learned that truth telling is optional and that's unacceptable. And the last strategy of um, WHO's Global Patient Safety Action Plan for patient family engagement is to empower us with the right kind of information, with reliable information, with, relate, with action, you know, with information that activates us. You know, it, it, with jaundice and with carnicterus, we recently went through a revision with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and originally the doctors wrote it, and I'm all for doctors. I'm married to a doctor, so I, I, you know, I'm not dissing any doctors. Um, but it was all clinical. It talked about the liver and the sluggish uptake of the hepatic uptake and the red blood cells break. And the mom said, we don't care about that. We want to know what do we need to do to take action to prevent harm. So I think we can do a much better job of getting patients and families at the table recreating patient information that speaks to us, that motivates us. And finally, I want to say that um, Sir Liam and Neelam, I think we'll bring up, Sir Liam already did, um, Patients for Patient Safety, a, a global network of patients, of which Yvonne, you part of, and um, Helen and um, Melissa, who spoke. I think we have several champions in the room, but we're, champions are ad advocates. And you know, there are over, what, 400? champions globally of networks in, in several countries. And I want to read something that um, is our North Star. And I think it's a message to all of us. And it hasn't changed. This was crafted in 2005 by patients from 21 countries, all who'd experienced harm from unsafe care. And we, this was under Sir Liam's leadership that we got together in 2005. And it's called the London Declaration, because we all met in London. And we really hadn't planned on creating a declaration. Matter of fact, we didn't even know what declarations were at the time. But this is, this is the, our North Star. This is our vision and our promise. Um, and this is, you know, patients, and we have several in the room. Um, we Just read the end of it, Sue. I think we want to have time for Vonda. <laughs> What's that? I said, can you just read part of it? So we will. Part of it. Well, why don't we just leave it in the. Go for it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll speak fast. Okay. So I was going to read. We patients for patient safety envision a different world in which healthcare errors are not harming people. We are partners in the effort to prevent all avoidable harm in healthcare. Risk and uncertainty are constant companions. So we come together in dialogue, participating in care with providers. We unite our strength as advocates for care without harm in the developing as well as the developed world. We are committed to spread the word from person to person, town to town, country to country. There is a right to safe healthcare and we will not let the current culture of error and denial continue. We call for honesty, openness, and transparency. We'll make the reduction of healthcare errors a basic human right that preserves life around the world. We, Patients for Patient Safety, will be the voice for all people, but especially those who are now unheard. Together as partners, we will collaborate in devising and promoting programs for patient safety and patient empowerment, developing and driving constructive dialogue with all partners concerned with patient safety, establishing systems reporting and dealing with healthcare harm on a worldwide basis, and defining best practices in dealing with healthcare harm of all kinds and promoting these practices throughout the world. So in honor of those who have died, those left disabled, our loved ones today, and our children yet to be born, we will strive for excellence so that all involved in healthcare are as safe as possible 
as soon as possible. This is our pledge of partnership. So I hope we can all take that pledge. Thank you, Sue. That went faster than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vonda, take us home. <laughs> uh, well, I'll say that I was here for not the first year, but I think the second year. My husband died in 2012. In, in just 18 days, it will be his the 11th year anniversary. And over these 11 years, I have noticed the narratives change, in part because of summits such as this. And there are a few noticings that I think stand out for me that I think would be very helpful for all of us to consider. One is that there is a distinction. I make a, I make a strong distinction between implementation and integration. Um, I leave implementation to the systems, the relationship between what we know and the processes and policies that we know need to be put in place and, and actually implementing those so that they happen. For me, a lot of the work is on the integration. That's the human and culture side of the equation. That is the capacity that we have as human beings in the relationship with each other and those processes and policies and systems that help us give input into the system, that help us receive that input um, in an active, ongoing way, and then most importantly, help us integrate that feedback, that input. And one of the things that I think stands out for me most over these last 11 years, but I will say 10 years just in terms of it took us a while to even recognize that, that there was errors as common as, as they are then, is that there's been a, a strong leaning and bias. Uh, and by bias, I really mean like it, it aligns for me around the purpose, around the motivation. What are we motivated here to do? And the origin stories of healthcare and medicine are the, the strongest motivations are around that human relationship to our health and our well being. And there has been a there has been a shift in awareness, and I have certainly hoped to have been a part of this, and I know that my loved ones here um, in the family of patient safety have helped shift the awareness that the business of healthcare is interrupting and has been a, central, a centralized component of the delivery and the motivation of that intention to give well-being forward. And I think we need to be honest about that and to unpack it and to not be shy or concerned about raising the hard questions around the ways in which monetarily uh, we also have to be attentive, but not in replacement for that human relationship. So I would just leave us with that need and uh, I think call for action as activists, thank you. To, to really make the discernment between the implementation of AI and technology and all those things that are so critically important and so important, policy process, and also that need for our human cultural integration to learn how to be with these mistakes because they're going to continue to happen. And our psyches, our egos, our, our relational aspects with each other really need to know how to integrate this learning um, because it's really not enough to just simply learn along the way. As Maropi, you pointed out so um, poignantly and I think was certainly the case with us is that it had been 40 years that there was knowledge around uh, hospital-associated venous thromboembolism when my husband died. It, we knew what to do. We hadn't integrated it at an individual level. And so uh, I hope I will leave you with that and thank you for um, allowing Yogi Raja's experience to continue to help, um, to, to inform, to help with the learning, but also help with the integration.
So we do have time for a few questions. I have one for you, Henrietta, from Joe Chiani, who says, um, when you hear about Martha, what do you think should be done to keep this from happening again? So uh, the first thing I was going to say is that there's no doubt that everyone here on the panel and everyone else who's been speaking at the conference today, it's not because of lack of being articulate or asking the right questions. It's not, a, I agree about patient and family empowerment, but I think about it much more from the perspective of those who are delivering care, that leaders need to create the intent to listen and to understand the, the societal and cultural biases that we have, uh, speaking as a doctor, but I've also been a patient and I will be a patient in the future. That the words that are used by patients and families do not have the same power and value in the healthcare settings as those used by professionals. And those, those, th there's an undoubted uh, injustice in that. There's an injustice in knowledge, there's an injustice in the patients and families narrative, and there's also an injustice in the, the language because doctors are more likely to believe and understand each other. And we have to take this on board and use this as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a reality to then act on that. And when I see uh, descriptions of healthcare systems, they normally start with governments and with, with regulators and providers up at the top and patients down at the bottom. But we need to change that entirely so that patients and citizens and families are at the top. Because that's who the governments are accountable to in the first place. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I would say that the most important thing in this is that we are always putting that listening with intent and with a real uh, curiosity to every single word that patients and families are saying. And I'm, I'm very lucky in my own clinical practice that I had additional training for a year of listening to the patient's and uh, family's narrative and maintaining that intense curiosity to every single word that, that is being told to me. But even then, I'm sure I have my own biases. We, we, we jump to try and understand the, 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 the pattern and, and the diagnosis um, and stopping and pausing and listening. But then also, what is it that's stopping other members of staff from speaking up if they're not content with what they're seeing? Um, and my previous role was setting up the speak up process for, for the healthcare system in England. And I know that fear and futility abound. So the more that we're able to have a, a, a just culture, a learning culture, and one that uh, the resources follow the recommendations, I think is absolutely key. Um, I'm absolutely, uh, you know, appalled from the things that I've heard today and the examples that I've heard. And I know that these are, you know, just some of many, many tens and hundreds of thousands of examples. And what we have to do is take that on board and build it into the way that we educate, the way that we commission and train and work as, as members of teams. And I'm sure that the pandemic as, as much as any other uh, you know, problem that we have with workforce, et cetera, is going to act as a barrier. So what we have to do is take all of that learning and then dismantle those barriers one by one. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we always say is that it's not patient engagement that's the problem, it's provider engagement. Absolutely. The patients are engaged, <laughs> um, but they're not received. Mm -hmm. Merope, we've got about a minute left. I wonder if you could just very high level talk about some of the solutions you're seeing. Um, so um, after I wrote about what happened to Martha in The Guardian, um, I was contacted by a lot, a lot of people, a lot of doctors, a lot of patients who'd had similar experiences. Um, I think that's how you messaged me originally. But um, the um, uh, I was contacted by some people in Australia where they have something called Ryan's Rule. Um, uh, it's just a, it's only in Queensland, Australia, I think, uh, where patients can request a uh, clinical review uh, for themselves or for a family member in hospital. And they said, you know, if you'd had something like this, this could have helped Martha. And um, 
uh, we have been uh, talking about trying to create a similar Martha's rule in uh, the UK. I would say that the main thing I felt when I was in hospital is totally powerless. I had no power. I was not part of the team of people looking after Martha. I think back to that last day um, when she got the rash and I could, the consultants in the morning were talking to each other and they were whispering outside, um, outside the room. And I remember craning to try and hear what they were saying. And I know now that what I should have been doing is saying, Sorry, can you tell me what's going on? Because I need to know as much as you, because I'm right here all day, and you're going to be doing other things. But it, at the time, it didn't occur to me. I, I didn't know that that was my right. I, you know, it, it's, it's hard to explain if you've never been in hospital before. And I should say, we'd never been in hospital ever. Not, no one in our family. We had no experience of this. We weren't medical families. We didn't know how the system worked. We didn't know that errors like this happen all the time. And, um, well, not all the time, but, you know enough to worry. And so I wish we'd had more power and um, I, and the numbers of people that saw Martha as she was deteriorating over the course of a week, nobody spoke up. Um, any number of them could. Some of the nurses did document they were worried, but they didn't speak up. They were all doing what the most senior person was doing, which was nothing. Um, and I wish that I could have created a critical care review and insisted on it. And what I said to Helen was that the idea was this is a metaphorical red button where you could insist that a uh, critical care review happened if you were worried that you or your family member was deteriorating. The argument against it, people say, is that uh, patients will overuse it, which to me is just another way of patronizing patients and saying they're idiots who don't know what's going on in their body. They do, they won't overuse it, they're not going to press it for a cold. I know I wouldn't have done it, but I would have done it if I'd known about it at that time. Helen said, why does it have to be a metaphorical red button? Why can't it be an actual red button? <laughs> but, but the point is that, you know, patients aren't idiots, and, and, and uh, parents aren't idiots <laughs> who overreact about things. You know, you, you know when something's wrong, you make that judgment. And, um, and I'd like there to be more power in the hands of the patients. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you all. I think that's it for our panel. I just, I just want, I can't resist a couple of last words, which is, you know, this is not just one of the pillars of patient safety. It really is the foundation of patient safety. We're all people. Uh, and we need to relate to each other. And if we can't get this right, um, after trying all these centuries, really, we can't do anything. So let's do it. <laughs>